Chapter 9 of The Blue Cat of Castletown by Catherine Kate Koblenz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter 9 The Bright Enchantment. Today, Castletown in Vermont is a town of yesterday. A town not built to seem like yesterday, a town not restored but kept. Castletown is real. Statement made by a recent visitor. Castletown is enchanted, even as it was when the settlers came, bringing beauty and peace and content through the wilderness, so it is today. The pride of Castletown is in the pulpit in its church, which is the most beautiful pulpit in Vermont and in the houses, porticos, archways, and stairways which Thomas Royal Dake the carpenter, the artist of yesterday, fashioned. Upon the whole town this man has set his touch-mark, as surely as Ebenezer Southmaid ever set his upon pewter. The stranger passing through drives more and more slowly, until he stops and says, There is a spell upon this place. Once a year, the doors of the homes of Castletown are opened, and all the beautiful treasures which the song of the blue cat caused to be fashioned are shown to strangers who come from far and wide to see them, and to hear the story of Castletown. Two things the visitors do not see. One is the teapot of Ebenezer Southmaid. Folk still speak of it, but no one knows what has happened to it, or where it may be hidden. The second treasure that is missing is the carpet which Sir Rua Guernsey fashioned. For that carpet, together with the hearthrug of the blue cat, hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of the City of New York. If you doubt this story, you can go and see for yourself. In the daytime, the blue cat will give you stare for stare. But at night, when the museum is quite empty and a blue moon shines through the windows, then the blue cat's song may be heard echoing down every corridor. Did not the river say he should live forever? Aruna? Scarce a soul remembers him. For his spell over Castletown was completely vanquished even as the river had hoped. Though, as the river had likewise promised, Aruna died to the tune of his own song of speed, crushed beneath the wheels of a train. Even today, the sound of the train whistle through the valley is a sound to chill one's bones. It is all that remains of the dark enchantment. As for the river which flows through the valley, Go and sit beside it. And if you should hear it suddenly begin to sing its song, turn quickly. There in the reeds for an instant, if you are quick enough, you will see a small blue shadow. For, of course, it is hardly to be expected that the blue cat, who was no ordinary cat, stays in the Metropolitan all the time. Sing your own song. Sing well, sing well. How the Blue Cat of Castletown Came to be Ridden The people of Castleton sing their own song to this day. Not long ago, reports reached Washington that on Grandpa's Knob, a high point above this Vermont town, what looked like a giant windmill turned great arms in the sun. It was said that this was a wind turbine, which was seeking to use the wind to generate electricity. So, in the summer of 1946, Catherine Koblenz went to Castleton with her husband, who was interested in seeing this experiment. There, at a church supper, Holda Cole, the village librarian, told her that Castleton was noted as the site from which Ethan Allen set out to take Fort Ticonderoga, and that the town 
was justly proud of two of its early citizens. One was the carpenter who built there the most beautiful church pulpit in Vermont, as well as many of the town's beautiful houses. The second was a girl who had designed and fashioned a carpet so beautiful and unusual that it hung now in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. On that carpet, among other designs, was pictured a most fascinating blue cat. Why a blue cat? inquired Mrs. Koblenz. But no one in all the town could say. Although there were those who recalled having heard that in the days when the carpet lay on the floor of its creator's parlor, any cat walking into the room for the first time would always stop short, arch his back, and spit at the blue cat pictured beneath his nose. In the winter of 1946, Holda Cole sent the source material of the town, which had been gathered by Mary Garish Higley and left to Mrs. Cole personally, to Catherine Koblenz in Washington. Its unexpected arrival was so tempting that Mrs. Koblenz studied it carefully, and twice returned to Castleton to see and learn more. Not only was the history fascinating in itself, but the stuff of folklore was there. And so the author has handled it in this book. For a year and a half, she insists, the blue cat sat on her pillow, night after night, trying to purr his story into her not unwilling ears. Being a Vermonter by birth, Mrs. Koblenz was prepared to evaluate highly the spell which even to this day lies over this Vermont Valley town. Every person mentioned in the book actually lived in the town, and did the things of which this book tells, and the names are the real names of those individuals of yesterday. Or to sum it up, every word in the book is true, and there isn't a word of truth in it. End of chapter 9 End of The Blue Cat of Castletown by Catherine Kate Koblenz Recorded by Peter Eastman 2013 Thank you for listening.